Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. I have here today a very special guest with a hell of a story. Please welcome to the show Picasso, and you'll find out why he goes by that name during the course of this interview. Picasso, how are you, my friend? I'm good. Thank you for having me on the show, man. I was like, I was driving 100 miles an hour to get up to your show today, brother. <laughs> I had to be here, and especially on time. It was killing me. Well, well, you made it. I'm glad we didn't get in any uh, wrecks and getting pulled over by any John Q. Laws on the way up here. We've got enough run-ins with them here lately, so we'll keep your nose clean. That would have been bad. <laughs> bad for business. <laughs> um, so you've got a very interesting story, man, and we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get into it here. But first, let's start with some of the more general questions, since it's your first time on the show. Tell us a little bit about you and where you grew up, what early life was like, and then we'll get into the reason why we're here. Um, I was born and raised in Brooklyn since, uh, I mean, uh, literally I was born on 57th Street and between 3rd and 4th Avenue. And I spent uh, 16 years of my life in that neighborhood. You know, and life for us was uh, very rough. My mother was a uh, one income family. Our father was, was not around. Um, at a very early point in my childhood, I had a very traumatic incident that changed the way I see life itself. So that's really what molded me. That's really what made me who I was. I grew up on the street. I'm a street guy. Right. Okay. So what, what part of Brooklyn are you going to mind me asking? Sunset Park. Sunset Park. Okay. Sunset Park, born and raised. All right. All right. I've been up there a few times. And uh, one of the last times we was at a studio somewhere near um, Red Hook, I think it was over there. Uh, some of my best clients are in Red Hook. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, did you, you start this whole thing starts by you? Was you a painter by trade? Was that your regular job? Was that something that you had, you know, been into for a while or how did that come about? Um, I've been a painter since I was uh, 14. I've always been, I started working very early in, at, at the age of 10. I started working to help my mother out, you know, cause, uh, she couldn't do it on her own. And I had, uh, two older sisters, a younger brother. So I hustled for them, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, the painting thing, I started at the age of 14 for the summer job to bring in a little check. And from that point on, I was a painter for my entire life. And then were he's painting what, like, you know, houses or buildings or what was that? At the very beginning, I did uh, apartments in uh, in uh, Red Hook, in uh, Bay Ridge and Park Slope, you know, a little cheap apartments. But then eventually I got a job on the Upper East Side working for this very extravagant painting company. And that was pretty much all she wrote. Once I got in that door, I stood with that forever. Okay. And I mean, when I've traveled to New York, man, there was like a 10 year gap from the first time that I, or the last time that I went, as opposed to about a year ago, because I had a little trouble with the, with the law myself for a while and, and couldn't leave the States. And when I went back, I couldn't recognize a damn thing. I mean, there's so much construction going on there. I can only imagine how busy constructions and painters and, and everybody else stays around there. I mean, the, the work around there must just be nonstop. It pretty much is nonstop. Not only it comes from all aspects, there's commercial, there's residential, there's the actual tenants, you know, so, uh, especially New York, the New York, the, the money falls from the sky. It, it rains yeah. money over there. Right. So this specific, how long did you paint before, this situation happened that we're going to get into? Uh, the situation that happened, the, the one where I got arrested? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, from the point I started to the point that I got arrested was probably 20 years. 20 years. So yeah. in, to the point you got arrested, did this happen any point in time before that? No. No. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the client that hired you for this particular job and kind of what exactly has you here today, which by the way, I'm assuming that's the, uh, the poster of the movie 
behind you there. You just got back from a screening. I don't want to give away too much too early, but this story that you're hearing here today, folks, and he hasn't done a lot of these interviews is being turned into a movie. So you're going to want to get the inside scoop here. So kind of give us a little bit of insight on what you were doing at the time this job came about, who it was, and kind of walk us through this whole process. Um, after I had the traumatic incident in my uh, in my childhood, I found a way to cope. I, f- I never had a need for money, so this was not a monetary gain. You know, you can't you can't sell artwork. Artwork is one of those things that there's no black market for, really. Right. I can tell you, as a professional, there's no black market for artwork. You ain't googling black market. You ain't finding the number. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's like that but, big uh, art heist they had in Boston years ago, where all those paintings got stolen. None of them have ever been recovered. So they're either hanging in somebody's basement or they got destroyed. You know, no, you can't sell that shit. Nobody would destroy them, but yeah, they're somewhere. Nobody would ever destroy them. Yeah, that'd be crazy to destroy artwork. That was sacrilege. Yeah, but um. What I was going to say is my thing, it manifested, you know, it was like my way to cope. It was, uh, you know, when you go into some of these Park Avenue apartments and some of these ultra rich 1% apartments where the apartment is 150 million, 200 million, you know, a quarter of a million, uh, just in, in, in furnishings, you know, it's just amazing the amount of money that, that that's here. You know, sometimes we used to stack the Picasso's in the closet, you know, it's like, and I'm talking about stack them, not, you know, there there wasn't one. And if it was one was missing, you missed it. You know, we're talking about two or three hundred pieces. Jeez. You know, my mouth would water. <laughs> <laughs> so were you into that level of painting, like the Picassos and all the other, the high end arts? You were that far deep into the paintings as well at this time? No, I, I we, we only did, um, the painting company only did like fancy finishes. Whole finishes yeah, but just your knowledge of the subject of these oh, things. Always. But it was an under, um, I had been learning it without knowing about it, you know, right. since I was in junior high school, reading the Wall Street Journal, New York Times on the way to school. Mm-hmm. You know, teachers used to tell me, read the smart papers. So I would read it. So it was building in my head. I didn't know I it was building. It was there. And I knew every piece, you know, it was so crazy because when I first walked in, that apartment, I believe it was on uh, Central Park West. And I first walked in and I was like, I was just like, I, I, could, I couldn't even form words. And the thing is, dude, with the ultra wealthies, a lot of times they look, so, they look so far past you that you're invisible to them. They don't even see you. Yeah. Like you're not there. Wow. So who was the people that hired you for this particular job in question? Because they were pretty prominent family. This was what, in Long Island? Well, that family, um, it, we were actually uh, hired through a decorator. Okay. So the decorator hired us, and uh, we went to work for this family. And then we had a reputation with them. So we built the reputation over the years. Did the houses in the Hamptons, in uh, Manhattan, up in Carmel, New York, up in West Palm Beach. You know, we did it all for them. We did it all for every, we did it all for the 1%. The entire, uh, the, every paint job we did for was for a 1%, the top of the upper crust, you know? Right. Now, when you go in this particular house, did you have a personal relationship with these people? You knew who they were? I didn't know who they were. They were just clients. Client. Okay. And I mean, did you just, when you come in, you spotted some of these pieces of artwork right off the rip? Yes, absolutely. Right off the right off the start, jump right off the jump. The the thing is with me is even. All right, let's put it this way. We have anytime I walk into a room, right? Most people walk into a room, and they're oblivious to every single thing that's around them. Like they don't have any clue. I walk into a room, and I can tell you how much somebody, how much money they have in their bank account. Yeah. If they if they have a girlfriend, I can tell you everything. If they own their house, you know, I it, it's just this is something that comes like instinct. It, right. I can't control it. It's automatic. Right. So you walk in. I mean, how many pieces are there throughout this home? What's that? What size square footage was this home? I say that this square home was probably sixty five hundred square feet. 
Oof, model. It was a massive home. It was gigantic. It was a museum. Yeah. And this it is in Long museum. Island, it was? Yeah, it was in Kings Point. Kings Point. Okay. Which is the most secure neighborhood pretty much in the world. Yeah. There's cameras on every street corner, on every light. Uh, where is that in relation to, isn't there a tote hill up there? No, now you're talking Staten Island. Oh, that's Staten Island. Okay, I'm getting <laughs> confused. All right. Okay. Um, so you see in all these paintings, you guys are hired to what? Just paint, I'm assuming, just the walls and the uh, throughout the house or certain rooms. What is your specific job in this in this house? Our jo- uh, our job was to uh, touch up any paint that needed to get touched up, uh, re- do some touch ups. But, you know, just uh, general banister touch-ups and stuff like that. Maybe a couple of ceilings. You know, nothing major. Okay. And, and nothing fancy. Okay. So, I mean, probably not going to be in there very long then, I guess, all things considered. But I, I believe it was a month. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I guess... Everything, everything for the wealthy takes four <laughs> times as much. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can believe that for sure. So, what prompted you to take this artwork and tell us, walk us through what prompted you to do it and how you did it? It was, it's an overwhelming feeling. I, you know, it's like uh, when you first see an original, when you first see an original piece of artwork. But first of all, you got to know how to see an original. Right. When you first see the original piece of artwork, it's something if you can appreciate it, you can tell what the artist went through to get to what he put on that piece of artwork. It's amazing. It's like if you ever go to a museum and you, you but you got to absorb the artwork and you got to really feel it. You got to understand the language. It's the, you know, it's the right. whole language. You just don't go in and look and say, next, it, it doesn't work that way. You know, artists die for their work, you know. Right. But, um, There's a story the- in the painting. There's a struggle in the painting. Every painting, kind of like, you know, I, I kind of quoted, I've heard people say, like, if you ever watch pro wrestling, the wrestlers tell a story throughout that match. The paintings tell a story of that artist, you know, through maybe whatever he was going through at that time of his life or, you know, just his life in general. Maybe it was someone else's story, but there is a, a message in the painting. Like you said, it's not just something you look at. Oh, that's nice. And then go on. So I get what you're saying. I mean, literally, if you look at it on, if you look at it on any given day and you want to, and if you want to absorb what the artist was doing, you can tell how he was feeling. You can tell what he was thinking. Uh, sometimes they put hidden images in the artwork so you can yeah. find them. You know, it's things that, I love, man. It's just like, it's like a, a human being on a piece of, you know, art. You know, it's amazing. When I saw the one I wanted, I had to take it. I didn't have a choice. You know, I was compelled. Like, literally, you know, I sat, I could sit there and I could say to myself, don't do it. I could do it a hundred times and I'm still going to say, fuck it, do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, you know, and I, and, it's not that, and I fight it. I fight the demon inside myself. I fight it every time, you know. It's like, I try to stop myself. I'll give you a perfect example. I stopped myself the other day. I went to a museum, <laughs> and I saw a Rembrandt. I love museums. I, love, I saw this Rembrandt. Dude, I'm standing in front of the Rembrandt, and I'm shaking. So the guard comes over, and he said, are you Okay. I said, I, I need you to know that I'm a art thief. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the only way I could break that cycle. You know what I'm saying? Otherwise, dude, I could have replaced it if I wanted to. I so, just could have. So when you say replace, what are you what are you doing here to to get away with this? Are you are you making fake ones and replacing them? Well, how are you doing this? I'm just replacing. I'm taking the old one out putting a new one in and making sure that the new one matches the old one. Now, how are you getting the old one? or the, the new one? Excuse me. How are you doing that? Kinko's. King- <laughs> well, I don't know if Kinko's exist anymore. Cause that was so long ago, you know, but I think Kinko's might not be there. It's FedEx. I think now. <laughs> so, you're, you're getting, 
You're getting what are you just ordering a copy? No, no, Kinko's does it right on the spot. Oh, they do. Okay. So, but I mean, you got to get them beforehand, right? You're just going in and swapping them in the house. Yeah, but usually Kinko's is, um, well, back in the day, Kinko's was on every corner up in, yeah. uh, on the Upper East Side, on the West Side. They were everywhere. Right. You go to Kinko's, and I would go in there, and depending on how thick the, the stock was on the painting, I'd match it up with their stock. So that way I had the same thickness. And then I do a high digital quality copy. And if I had to embellish it, then it had to take it home. But if, if I didn't have to embellish it and it was good to go, I w had some tools with me that I made it look perfect and put it right back. You know, th these people aren't buying art for an investment. That's not what they're buying. Are you see that poster behind you? Yeah. You bought it because you love it. That's it. Yeah. That's why they bought it. They didn't buy it because, oh, you know what? I'm going to make a million bucks off of it. It wasn't worth a million when they bought it. It was worth like 500 bucks. Right. <laughs> so. so whenever you have these copies, you bring the copy in with you, secured somehow, make your way to the original. What do you do? Cut it out or just swap frames? How do you, how are you doing it there? No, usually the, the original's already with me. If, if, I, if I'm going to take something, the original's already out. No, no, no. You know, so you're bringing the one it. you're replacing it with. When you're bringing in the one you're replacing it with, how are you bringing that in? Just in a bag or something? Hidden? Oh, the same way I took the other one out. Let's say if I took it out with a drop cloth or if I took it out uh, under under a ladder or something. Right. That's the same way I'll bring the other one back in. And you will never notice. Like, literally, I could be in the room with you putting the Robert De Niro on the wall and you won't know I'm even there because you're oblivious to it. You know, and that's the way life just functions with some people, you know? Yeah. Some of us see and some of us don't. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I absolutely, I'm one of those people too, like you said earlier, that when I walk in, I'm reading the room, I'm reading the people, I'm looking at the exits in case shit gets out of hand. Like, you know, and not, not that I live that type of lifestyle that I need to, it's just in general. Nowadays, the way people come in shooting and shit, mass shooting, you need to know where a fucking exit is, you know, yeah. where yeah. you sit. I'm I'm real particular about how I sit in restaurants. Like I I kind of like to prefer to sit my back to the wall so I can see other people. I don't like my back to the door, and like and that that's not that I'm I don't have anybody after me. At least not that I know of. But I've just always kind of been like that. <laughs> that makes two of us, brother. <laughs> you know, it's just something. Were you brought up on the street? No, no, not really. I mean, I hung around with a lot of people that come up on the street. I was very fortunate. I had a pretty good home life, but I always gravitated. My friends were people from the street and it was just, you know, I learned a lot from those friends as opposed to like, I didn't hang out with, I guess what you would consider other kids that had a good home life. Like me, most people were, were from broken homes. I mean, a few were, but most of them were from broken homes. A lot of my friends, you know, nowadays, as I'm I'm almost 40 years old, I look back, a lot of them are in jail, a lot of them are dead. Um, you know, a lot of them, you know, God knows where some of them are. There's only a handful that, that straightened it out along the way. But coming up, a lot of them were, you know, they were rough and they were rowdy. And I hung out with a lot of those guys. You know, but that's the thing, too, is, you know, we all make up some excuse why we're messed up. Right, but we don't make up. We we shouldn't have to make up excuses why we learned so much on the street, why we met such grubby people, why we met such rough people, people that didn't have it as good as us. You know, you got to absorb all that stuff and and appreciate it because that's what makes us who we are. Otherwise, we'd be these stuck up, conceited people walking around un not understanding why people can't afford sneakers. You know, right. I mean, if you can gravitate around that, because I've been from starving i've been to billionaire status you know working for these people i got treated like a billionaire so i've been you know i've been up and down the realm i'm comfortable i don't yeah. need to be anywhere else yeah both ends <laughs> of the spectrum and now i mean yeah I, I can sympathize with that because i mean obviously like, coming up everybody wants like shoes were a big thing when i was in middle school and i remember my mama telling me like you know i don't know if i'll be able to get those and i remember my grandmother surprising me coming to the house and surprising me. So she made sure I got the shoes. So I didn't have a lot of money and I had, you know, some friends that did, and it was kind of, you got that vibe, like, you know, God, you had to get, you couldn't get those or something like that. And I never, I just, those people never sat right with me, man. I always 
just gravitated towards the people that usually got in trouble for whatever reason. I mean, that was just, I could, I could resonate with them more for whatever reason still to this day. I mean, this podcast, everybody that I talked to, I mean, you know, has done something in one way or another. And I just, I don't know. I just have way better conversations with them. I get better vibes off them. Uh, that's just kind of how it's always been. You know, and that's it. You know, that's the thing. That I, I agree with you a hundred percent. I feel like, um, if you haven't experienced everything, you only see one view of things. So you can't like, you can't connect, you know, you know on so many levels, you can only see if I, if I lived on park Avenue, my entire life, I only understand posh. Right. You know, I don't understand poor. Yeah. You know, so you get this first painting. Did you only take one the first time? Yeah. And what did you, what was your plans with it? What would you want to do with it? You want to keep it? You want to try to sell it? No, I was keeping that. I was keeping it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you see, the thing is that, like I said, it, you know, there's no black market for it, but the, the right. thing, it, I didn't need the money. It wasn't about the money. It was about that rush. It was about feeling that someone's going to walk in that room at the moment you take it or see you walking out or wh whatever it may be. It's just that drug, that drug. Cause I didn't, I don't smoke. I don't drink alcohol. I don't, you know, none of that stuff at the time, you know, now I smoke pot to calm my anxiety and the monster, but, uh, I didn't do drugs. So I needed something. That was, that was my edge, bro. That was it. <laughs> no, that's, that's completely understandable. So this went off without a hitch. Nobody was the wiser. Everything went smooth. Absolutely. Like a caddy driving down the block. <laughs> and I know how good those drives. I drive a Cadillac. So I, <laughs> I love them. That's very smooth. <laughs> um, how long before the first one did you pull the second? Six months later, because we were still at the first apartment for about six months. Okay. What was the second one you took? The second one was a much smaller painting. It was a tiny little painting, but it was amazing. It was just this amazing picture. It was just something that captivated me. It was just, I, I love dark. There's something about a dark painting that can draw me into a room faster than any other painting. Right. This painting was dark. Like literally there was a million paintings around it. And uh, this painting drew me right to it. And that was the painting I had to take. I took it. So fairly and easy to get out. I try to talk my way out of it. I do. I Like I said, I do try to say to myself, one conscience says, don't do it. The other one says, fuck that. Take that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's called the angel and the devil. I believe, I believe that's it what it's called. It literally is. It literally is. <laughs> oh. All right. So what did you do with that one? Did you keep that one too? Yeah, I kept. I I, I until the very last one, the very last one that I got caught for, right. I've never sold the painting. Never. You will never, you will never find anything linked to me saying that I sold the painting to anyone, period. Right. I just so don't do that. How many did you take before they started noticing something? What do you mean on the last job? How yeah, many so like, they, you, you went through a period of time at that one job and then I guess in the midst of that, you were no longer there. They realized something and then they hired you back. And then at that point they installed hidden cameras, right? Yes. They were looking for one painting. Okay. So in the period of time from when you started to the first time you left, how many pieces did you take total? From the, from this one job? Yes. I believe it was four total because three, it was the one. And then there was the three that was still in the trunk, but I had to confess to taking six because that's the only way they were going to let me go. Oh, so the other two, I'm sure are in the garbage somewhere. Cause insurance, let me tell you something, you know, and this is just layman's thing. Paintings aren't worth jack. You insure them for as much as you can. If they're stolen and the house burns down, you win. Yeah. But if it doesn't, you're going to get, a, for a $50,000 painting, you're going to get exactly what I got was 8500 bucks. Wow. 
That was it. There's no, you know, this is all just bullshit, you know? Yeah. So what painting were they hunting that led them to figure out that something wasn't right? I believe it was the De Buffet painting. There was a De Buffet painting that was missing, I believe. Okay. And um, that was one that they were looking for. But the thing was, you see, this is the whole complicated factor. The day I got on that job, the day, day one, day one, I, had, I didn't even change my clothes yet. I already knew that that job had been robbed. The job had been robbed by several different people, okay, before I got there. I just knew it. Well, I, mean, I was speaking to my guys, and my guys told me, oh, someone did this and someone did that. And I, in my head, I was calculating, yeah, they didn't do anything. They stole that shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then the worst part is, this is a minuscule, this is nothing. This is one pee in the pod. After they started investigating me, they found out that there was a million dollars they they uncovered that he lost out of a sale of painting, and they found it. You did you have you ever lost a million bucks around there? Is it on the shelf? Yeah, I'm I'm no I'm not losing that. I can guarantee. I'm keeping that shit somewhere. Where I know a million dollars. It's like what? But I guess I to them, that's the equivalent me. of me losing like a five dollar bill. You know, if I don't find it, it's not the end of the world. I guess that's what that that is to them. He didn't even know it was missing. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's now, crazy, right? so you didn't replace every single one you took? Some of them you just outright took? Only three I outright took, yeah. Okay. So at some point after you're no longer on that job, I guess they find out that it's missing. And do they just kind of have a suspicion that it might have been you? No. They started fishing. Okay. They started bringing back anybody that was in the house and they, you know, ran the bo same booby trap thing or whatever. Okay. And so they didn't just bring it. back you. They might have brought in people that were there before you, after you, everything. Yeah. Okay. And and you could, if you look at the, the reality show, the reality show is called the Brooklyn DA. Yep. And I'm featured in episode number one and number three. If you look at it and you hear them, they'll tell you on the, on the audio, they'll say, uh, if he doesn't take any paintings, we have him on nothing. Yeah. You'll hear it. So if I didn't take those, I would have been okay. Yeah. So they reach out to all these people. The, the idea is here, and I guess you can tell me if I'm wrong. They have a feeling that the painters took it. So what they decide to do, and it, what, who did they go to? Just local police? It, I'm sure it started from the uh, district attorney in Brooklyn. Then they went to the Nassau County uh, Police, and I believe the FBI were also involved in, at the very beginning. Right. And then, uh, they, you know, they dumped the case on the two, Nassau County and Kings County. Okay. So what they did here was apparently set up hidden cameras, unbeknownst to anybody that they would have bring brought back to the house. And basically, kind of, if you want to get technical, almost in trap. I mean, they're laying out the cheese there. For the mouse, I mean, hoping somebody bites and then they, they'll figure they have their man. When they call you back, what do they do? Reach back out to the company you work for, say they need some more work done? Yeah, well, actually, they do more than that. They reach out to them. They tell them, look, we're the DA's office. We want to set up a thing. Oh, so and, they told them all that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that's just from the fact that I missed uh, the, the red flag. You know, I was... I smoked two fat blunts that day. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's like I tell everybody, there was red flags coming out my ass. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I heard from one little bird weeks before I got there that the DA was investigating or that there was cops investigating about something. I should have bailed then. Yeah. Then I got there and the bosses were acting a little suspicious. I should have bailed then. I didn't. I had I was high. I was like, uh, <laughs> <"Those are my> <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> oh shit! Okay, so you go up there and you just what? You spot another one, and it's like you gotta get it. You gotta have it. Yeah, this is this. We're going into retirement now, though. We're right. going into uh, you know, these are my last years. My body's jacked, so I'm going in there and uh. This is going to be my 
my gold bag. This is going to be my like my my gold watch. You know, yeah. to get that for the MTA. Your, your retirement. <laughs> yeah, my present. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so you what what do you how do you try to get this which one is it which one is it to start with the picasso that's the okay all right so this is the picasso this is like leave the picasso behind are you crazy and then you know that you're in a fucking box that's no respect so that you use the picasso and i'll mix the plaster on it come on <laughs> So they had it in a box. Yep. What's the what's the retail value? What what I don't want to say retail value. What's the value of this painting? Their value, the insured value? Yeah. I believe the insured value was fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. But the real value was probably thirty five hundred. Yeah. We can make believe fifty thousand, but it was really thirty five hundred. Wow, that's that's some serious fucking markup there with those paintings. Yeah. It's like jewelry. <laughs> it really, it's only up to who's in the room and wants to buy it at the time. Right, if yeah. that person is there, you're going to get that guy that says, I'll take it for 100 bucks." <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, I think, overlook that fact when they say, oh, it's worth this, it's worth that. I'm like, look, it ain't worth shit if somebody's not going to pay you for it. Like, I mean, you know, you, you might have something that may have that much value, but that don't mean you have that value. I mean, I... I collect I collected baseball cards when I was young and, and recently my mom cleaned out a like a spare bedroom that had a bunch of stuff in it and she brought them to me. And I'm going through and looking at some of them. And I remember even back then, some of them was worth, you know, four and five hundred dollars. And now they're up for still like a thousand, you know, nothing, nothing crazy that I'm gonna, you know, so you know, quit my job over. But some decent money. And my wife's like, Wow, you can sell this and sell that. I'm like, look, just because it's worth that does not mean that's what people are gonna give you. I was like, you got to have somebody that specifically says, hey, I want that, you know, Yogi Bear or Nolan Ryan or whatever. You know, you've got to have that person. If you don't have that person, you you got nothing but a fucking baseball card. That's all you have. Exactly. Exactly. So you go in you there. Any, any kind of value. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So you go in there. You see this Picasso. You got to take it. You How do you get it out of there? I... Uh, Took the Picasso, I took the De Buffet, I put them in a garbage bag, and I took them out to Mercedes. Oh wow! So you took two? I took three. Oh, three, three. Okay, all right. Yeah, I came. I believe I came back for the third one <laughs> because uh, I believe one of them was pretty big. I believe the Picasso was the biggest one. <laughs> uh, forgot some tools here, folks. I'll be, be out of your way. <laughs> Okay, so how long after that did the police come knocking? I finished the end of the workday. I got in my car, drove maybe a quarter of a mile down the road, stopped at a stop sign, and a camera crew ran behind my car. I saw them in the rearview mirror. It was, they had one of those big boom lights, and they ran across the car, and I said, huh? That's a little strange, you know. We're here in the fog, and a guy runs across the street, two guys, one holding a boom and one a camera. And then SWAT, instantly, as soon as I looked that way, SWAT was everywhere. They came out of everywhere. But I didn't know why they were stopping me. <laughs> I had no fucking clue. You didn't You didn't think that, damn, they might have been watching me? That It didn't click? You had no idea? Who was watching me? There was nobody watching me. You know what I'm saying? It was that real. It was like there was nobody. Wa I didn't. If you look at the the video, you'll see that I had no idea what was going on. I didn't. Well, yeah. I couldn't comprehend. Yeah, you were just. It was just like business as usual. Yeah, it really was. It's like <laughs> what you know. What are you gonna say? The oh, what are those things in the back? Those are mine. <laughs> <laughs> You know, what what did they say when they came to the car? Uh, I believe they uh, read me my Miranda, and they thought this is the whole concept: is they read me my Miranda, and they were hoping, I guess they were praying that I would get on my knees and start crying like a bitch. Yeah, that's what they were praying for. 
Because I could tell you when they finally got me back to the station at King's Point, it was literally like something at a son, uh, king, a son of uh, anarchy where it was a huge conference table and all the all the DTs got their badges on their chest and they're all sitting there, you know, waiting for them to bring me in and crucify me. And I'm like, they showed me some pictures and I didn't recognize two of the paintings because those two paintings, I did not take them. I did not recognize them. So immediately I said, where's my lawyer? So all this drama that they set up with the big table and 35 detectives and all this bullshit, that was a waste of their fucking time. <laughs> that was a waste of their fucking time. Because it made them look like assholes. I mean, let's just be honest. You got 35 fucking guys and you got a schmuck. I'm a fucking schmuck painter. And I tell you, where's my lawyer? So all that posing with your badge and all this looking hard and waiting for me to come crying. It never happened. It wasn't going to happen. Fuck that. <laughs> Did you have a lawyer on hand or on deck that you, I mean, if you had never no. really been in trouble, you probably didn't need one. Well, I've always been in trouble, but I never needed a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> who did you, I mean, who did you use? Did you have one in mind that you knew or did it was, I mean, I'm assuming you didn't go into a public defender. Actually, at the very beginning, I had a public defender. But after I told him to take his head and shove it up his ass, because I realized that he was uh, trying to take down my testimony to give it to the DA without trying to help me whatsoever, yeah. I pretty much told him, shove your head up your ass. I mean, and oh, yeah. um, within minutes of me doing that, I walked down to the Rikers Island and I was down in the, in the holding cell or whatever. And I'm thinking, who's the baddest lawyer? Remember, I don't have any money. I'm broke. I don't have any money. So I said, who's the baddest mother, you know, mother, motherfucker that I could find lawyer that will take the case and defend me? Because I'm not looking for, for someone that I'm going to tell you that I'm a goody two shoes. But that's, I, I don't want that. I want a guy who fights for guys like that. I know who I am. And I got Bruce Cutler, John Gotti's old lawyer. Oh, you got fucking Cutler? Yes, Holy shit. Bruce Cutler, bro. And you know what? After I got Cutler, that was it. I felt good. I was in Rikers. I was good. Hell yeah. I think anybody <laughs> would feel good after that. You know, you got a guy like that watching your back? Come on. You really going to worry about things? That's the best of the best. No, yeah, and for people that maybe don't know who Bruce Cutler is, I mean, like you said, he represented John Gotti in a number of his trials, um, you know, got him off on a ton of stuff. As a matter of fact, the only one that John Gotti did not get uh, found innocent on was the one that Bruce Cutler was not allowed to be his lawyer. I think that's when he had to go with Albert Krieger. Yeah, because he beat the feds. Yeah, uh, Bruce Cutler beat the feds, and nobody does that, you know. Yeah, a number of times he beat him. So what yeah. was uh what was um, I just said his fucking oh what was Bruce's like because you didn't have any money? How was he saying he was going to handle that? Well, the thing was with Bruce is uh, I already knew one thing that I did have a lot of was notoriety. I was on the front cover of every newspaper that you can name from here to Taiwan. From the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal, New York Magazine, literally, if you if you Google my name, you'll find me in Taiwan in some Chinese uh, Ty Taiwanian newspaper, which I found so incredible. Because why? You know, it doesn't make sense. I'm not a serial killer, right? But let me tell you, after after I got Bruce, I relaxed. I was able to, you know, do my own thing. You know, and deal with the situation at hand. You know, I was like letting somebody else drive. Right. So what were you looking at um, charge wise and what were they talking time wise? I mean, I know they're always going to come with the biggest fucking number they can get. Six years, 26 years. They wanted 26 years. Yeah, that's what they so, wanted. So let crazy. me guess. They're trying to use the value or the, probably the insured value of these paintings and put that as the number of amount of what you stole from these people, which that's why they would give you that many years. 
Yeah. When, like you said, the actual value of these paintings is probably 80% less than the number that they gave you. And that's, that's still maybe on the high mark. It literally is. Wow. The thing was, there was too much. I told you about the million dollars, right? You know wow. how they uncovered the million dollars? Wow. They used the subpoena. They illegally used the subpoena. The, I believe they used the Nassau County subpoena to obtain bank records in Kings County or vice versa with one or the other. And that was, that's a class D felony because you can't use the subpoena for whatever you want to. It's got to be for whatever specifies on the subpoena. Right. So they, once they did that, the judge was a little upset. You know, I was ready to go to court. Let me tell you something. I was ready to go to court because I was one way or another, I was going to confess that, you know, you know, these guys are fucking schmucks. You know, I was set up here. I'm some poor fucking schmuck. And this fucking guy set me up for some insurance scam. Yeah. You know, I'm just a painter. What the fuck do I know? These are just pretty pictures. <laughs> Can I have one? <laughs> <laughs> or three. <laughs> <laughs> or six. <laughs> okay, so that's what they're throwing the charges at you originally. What is Cutler doing here? Cutler's throwing everything at them. He's throwing every motion in the in the, in the book at them. I mean, we have motions that are in the law library right now under my name and his name. I mean, it goes on and on. He threw every motion from fruit from the poisonous tree, which was setting me up, to uh, it was just motion after just like the reality show. They filmed the reality show, and that was something else because you're you're uh, contaminating the jury pool. Yeah, everybody's able to watch this now. Yeah, but it's different, you know. It's different, like like you know. I tell everybody, you know, they could do whatever they want. They could break whatever laws they want. Once they got you in the cuff, they're gonna make every effort to prove that you're guilty. If you're not guilty, who gives a shit? They got yeah. the cuffs on you. You're guilty. Yeah, there was a big trial that just ended down here where I live at in South Carolina. I don't know if you heard about it, but it was the Murdaugh trial. It's about the lawyer. Oh, yeah. yeah. So this guy, he was already in jail for all the money fraud shit. Well, then he's getting brought up on the charges of murder for his wife and son. Well, before this jury happens, there's a 2020 out on him. There's a Netflix documentary out on him. And mm -hmm. a fuck, I think it was a Hulu documentary or HBO Max, one or the other. HBO Max documentary. You got three fucking documentaries. Painting this guy is the biggest asshole, and and he was. I'm not saying he wasn't, but painting this guy horribly. I don't get how that's not like something against that that you can release those things before this trial happens. Like I just don't understand that. Kind of the same thing in your case. They're releasing these TV shows way before the trial, so anybody that goes in there that's seen these TV shows is not really going to say a pay attention to a fucking thing and what that jury says they already had it made up in their mind what they thought how this played out before they go in there same thing with with uh alex murdoch i think anybody that watched those documentaries coming away thinking even if he didn't kill his wife and kid he was still an asshole he's still done a lot of bad fucked up shit so i think they went in there thinking he's not getting out of jail anyway fucking we're gonna find him guilty for this whether he did it or not absolutely once you already taint someone as a, as a bad person, they're tainted. You're not going to change anybody's perspective of anything. Yeah, absolutely. So how did this all play out in court? What, what was the final say? Okay, so we went back and forth. And uh, finally, on the day, we're ready to go to court to start the trial. Because I was ready to go to trial. I already had my, my story ready. I was ready to go to trial. I was set up on this, okay? The guy was going to commit an insurance scam, and he I was the unknowing party, all right? So that wasn't going to be very difficult for me to explain to the, to the jury because I'm just, like I said, I'm just a painter. Yeah. What the fuck do I know? That's not very complicated, you know? And when you have to convince somebody of that compared to someone committing insurance fraud, selling paintings, for 50 or they're worth 50 with insurance but 3,500 without you know that's not very difficult to have to explain to somebody 
Right. So while I was in there, I was doing my work. I was going to law library. I was practicing my own case inside my head. And I was also practicing it on other inmates, you know, running the case by them because they only knew me by Picasso. You know, so they're not going to testify against me. What they're going to do, go tell the jury, yeah, Picasso? Yeah, fuck it, out of here, you idiot. Who the... <laughs> you know, it's just... And the thing was, you know, I let it go. There's nothing you could do. You know, I wrote that ticket. I was in jail because I was in jail because I put myself there. Right. So what was on the day you were supposed to go to court? What, did they come back with some sort of plea or what, what happened? The minute the lawyer went in, we were ready to go. And the judge says, if you plead guilty right now, I do not want to take this case to court, he said. I, I mean to trial, he said. If you plead guilty now, I will release you today. So my judge said, because it was between two counties now, I had a million and a half bail. I had Nassau County for uh, half a mil and Kings County for a mil. So my lawyer said, look, if you drop both cases, then we'll plead guilty to both of them and he gets out today. They didn't let me out till Monday, but I pleaded guilty to both cases, signed things I didn't even do. I pled guilty to it all so they can let me out. And I did. I got out. Wow. So, no, that's it. After that, case is missed. Yeah, that was it. No parole, no, uh, no restitution, none of that. Holy shit. And there's two, still two paintings missing. And that's the two that you didn't know where they were when they showed you all those pictures. Absolutely not. But they don't want to hear it. Yeah. I mean, they just, it's like, they don't want to hear it. All they want to hear you say is yes. That's it, yes. Well, did Bruce take you out for a nice steak dinner or something after that? Because that had to be, that's a fucking win, brother, looking 26 years in the face and just pleading guilty. I mean, obviously, you got to take a felony, but who gives a fuck? You take that felony, you get out of that, and you just walk right out of jail. No parole, no no nothing. I think it's 20 felonies. 20? I think it's 20, something like that. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> yeah, all they did was lay them up like a cake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Son of a bitch. I don't get it. I, I don't understand that. I don't want to understand that. <laughs> well, uh, part of that, I don't know. Like, part of me says getting Cutler is a great idea because he is a great lawyer. And then another part of it is like, all right, anybody that comes in there who's getting represented by Cutler, they're really going to want to nail to the fucking wall because they don't like him. <laughs> you just said the catch-22. And that's exactly what I felt the whole time. Yeah, I felt like I knew he was in charge, but I knew that I was being made to pay because he was in the newspapers every day. Yeah. Every newspaper, he was right there saying that the – that the prosecutor, that the DA was committing felonies and so on. It was just, oh my God. Causing all kind of ruckus like, down there. It was like he was picking the fight and I was getting the punches in the face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it, man. When you get those high profile lawyers like him, and I've actually had Oscar Goodman on the show who represented a lot of mob people. Um, he represented the guy that supposedly hired Woody Harrelson's father to kill a federal judge. Um, he later went on and was the mayor of Las Vegas for like three, three terms, which is the most you can do out there. I mean, he was, he was not a very, he was respected as a lawyer, but he was not liked, especially by judges and, and prosecutors alike, you know? So that's the risk you take when you get some of those high profile guys, you know, you got to wonder if you're going to be the, the whipping boy for what they're doing. You know what I'm saying? But I mean, it, it definitely worked out well for you. So, I mean, I know you had to come out of that feeling, uh, fucking like a million bucks. After I came out, I lost everything. I yeah. lost everything. I was like, uh, dude, they took my Mercedes. My ex-wife took my Mercedes. I, I was homeless when I came out, literally. Like I was living with my mom. So I was like, I was done. So it was like, I came out and I'm supposed to be happy, but, the world caved in on me and I was screwed. Even my little girl. I mean, the whole purpose of me getting out and being on the straight and narrow was my daughter. And she was taken ready. They walked away with that. Wow. So what was kind of your next move? I mean, what was the next thing you was like, look, I got to, obviously you got to put one foot in front of the other and, and start over and rebuild. And that is the only bright side you can put 
onto that is you're not in jail to where you can't start trying to put something back together again. What was your, you know, next move there? I had to stop feeling pity for myself. Yeah. Because uh, for maybe a week or so, I was trying to uh, blame myself for everything that was going on. And if, if I was going to continue that, I was never going to get out of that hole. Right. You know, I pushed myself to get out of it and uh, started with the job and got my car back, got everything that I lost before, I picked it all right back. And that was, I dusted my shoulders off. And I made myself what I had to do. Well, there's one thing I'm actually a welder by trade. There's one thing that I like to tell, like my son and his friends, I'm like, if you get a fucking trade that can't be replaced by a robot or some sort of machine, you will have job security. And it really doesn't matter how, if you have a record or what I've worked with most of the people I've worked with in my life have had records. My dad hung sheetrock for a living Every member of his crew had a record. I worked with him for years when I was first coming up. When I first got my first welding job, everybody, I felt odd because I didn't have a record. Everybody had fucking records, be it drugs or, or whatever assaults, you name it. And then, you know, as the other businesses I've gotten into, it's like, it doesn't matter, but if you can pull off that trade, there's going to be a job for you somewhere. You're never going to have to, it's not like you're, somewhere with computers and you're working in an office around these people where a million other people can do your fucking job. That's not the yeah. case when it comes to a trade, especially if you do it well. So something like welding or HVAC or painting, that's something that really is going to secure you, you know, always to be able to find employment. And I'm assuming, does that what you went back to? I'm assuming. That's exactly what I went back to. That's what I enjoy. Yeah. You know, I truly enjoy painting. Okay. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a profession for me. It's something I do because I love. Right. You know. So how long down the pipe was it before somebody come knocking about wanting to try to turn this into a movie? Nobody ever came knocking. That's what, you know, I love that about you right now. Cause you know, you, you know, you went in a distant in an area that nobody touched me on. Dude. Nobody came knocking in, in, in fantasies. People come knocking. Nobody came knocking. <laughs> you know, I reached out to a couple of people and they were like, you know, it sounds like a, it, it sounds like a great story, but the mo money's not there. Right. So the money had to come from somewhere and I funded it. And we, we got with uh, Adrian Mazzone of Transmedia, which she is phenomenal. She hooked me up with uh, Ana Cepedas and uh, uh, Carlos Cepedas, which they are uh, award-winning producers, and they 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 did the uh, directing and executive producing for the film The Picasso of Thieves. And um, let me tell you, when you see this movie, oh my God, you're gonna be blown away! Like literally, it's Scarface, but it's a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> And you just had a screening of it, right, this past weekend? Yes, I did. And Miss Universes were there. Oh, my God. Tommy Harding was there. From uh, He wrote The Harding. The Hardening. There was um, uh, Matthew Cox was there. Uh, there must have been like six or seven different supermodels from Miss Universe were there. I mean, it went on. Cecilyn was there. She's a famous singer. Dude, it was like a, a gala event. It was amazing, dude. Wow. Where'd they have it at? Fort Lauderdale at the Savoy Theater. Wow. They, the Savoy Theater, yeah. I think that's what it's called. Savoy okay. Theater. I'm going down there in a couple of weeks. A friend of mine is having a movie premiere at the Hard Rock Theater. At the That's uh, where we came from, too. After We had the after party at the Hard Rock. Yeah, they got the day or night club there. <laughs> We're yeah. right next to it. We're in the uh, L Lounge. Okay, so where the day or night club is, if you look on that outside, there's like a big fucking TV screen out on the side. But that's where they're showing that movie at, at that premiere they're having. It's like the 28th of this month now. Yeah, this month. Yeah, what's the name of the movie? It's called The Mob King. It's a guy that uh, I'm friends with named Ciro DiPaggio. He, he had this vision of this movie he wanted to put together while he was actually incarcerated. And he got out. He funded up some money. He shot a pilot. He cut the pilot 
into like 10 minute single episodes. And then, you know, it went through a lot of stages of development, but it got pitched. It was almost turned into a series. Some things happened. It got swapped, turned into a movie. And I mean, he's had some, some top notch actors in it, like Bruce Socia, James Russo, Robert Lasarda, um, you know, a number of people involved with it. And it got put into a film festival last October I think it was the AMC Film Festival, if I'm not mistaken, out in California. It got picked up by a huge distribution company. And I think it's the 29th, 29th or 25th, I'm sorry, that it's actually being like everywhere. You'll be able to get it everywhere. Apple, Tubi, I mean, this is all platforms it's going to be dropping on. And they're having the, it's a one day or two days prior to when it drops, they're having the red carpet early watch premiere at the Hard Rock uh, the 24th of this month. That sounds like a party you can admit. Oh, fuck yeah. Oh, I'm going. Yeah, I told him. He was like, I don't know if you have any interest. And he didn't even get it out. And I'm like, I got interest. I'll be there. <laughs> I've got I've got a lot of interest. <laughs> oh, my God. Dude, yeah, so that sounds like a good time right there. A, a lot of the cast are going to come down. So it should be a good time. So, I mean, I hate I didn't know about this before. I might have would have tried to make it down there for this one because that sounded like a premiere I would not have wanted to miss. Mm-hmm. You know, and it wasn't, forget about the, the it was a carnival-like atmosphere. I mean, literally, it was right. amazing. But the movie, I've been watching movies since I was eight or nine years old. My mother, my whole life, every weekend. You know, whenever she could afford it. And then when I started working, I would go to the movies on my own. This movie was phenomenal. It grabs you the whole time you're there, and you don't want to look away because it's it's, throwing you in all different directions but it's making you feel the way Scarface made you feel you know when they're cutting that guy up in the shower yeah it makes you feel that way there's something dark about it which I love I love because that's the way he sees it I had no this is not a fluff film this is not oh he's the best in the world this is not this is what I want to know what you think about me and if it if it hurts it hurts you know what I'm saying and this Dude, this movie's real. When can we expect this thing to be dropping? I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping to hear what streaming platform it's going to be going on. Well, you know, once I you hope you have definitely it, let me know what platform that's going to be on. I'll take a look at it for sure. Well, I think you're going to be blown away, man. I really do. I mean, I hope you are. You know, I Absolutely. everything I told told in this, uh, in this documentary is the truth. You know, I, I, you, you don't do something like this without really opening up and saying, you know, this is what it is, you know, yeah. and bearing your soul to it for sure. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, what, what's next? What have you got on the horizon? I mean, obviously this is coming out. What is, what is next for Picasso? What's, what's on your list? Well, this is the thing. This is a whole evolution thing. Now movie comes out right now. I'm a painter. As soon as the movie comes out, if it's a hit, I'm going to be fired. (laughs) So that movie has to be a hit enough that it sustains me. So we're looking at a book deal. We're looking at a reality show, possible uh, big screen movie. And they even said a comedy too, which I thought would be phenomenal because a comedy, I got some ideas for that. Forget about it. (laughs) I've, I've seen a lot of robbery stories turn into comedies. Um, matter of fact, a guy that me and Matt Cox have both interviewed, um, David Gant robbed a Loomis Fargo, like the vault, like not a bank, but he was over the actual vault, like where they stored the money that would go from there to the banks. And it was like $18 million. And then he fled to Mexico. Some people that he was working with kept most of the money here. They wound up not giving him his part. They tried to fucking hire a hitman to go kill him. And that was turned into a movie called masterminds. And it had Zach Galifianakis playing him. Who, if you've ever seen like any of the hangover movies, he's the funny guy with the beard. Very, very funny dude. Um, and it was, Zach Galifianakis? yeah, I know who he is. Yeah. If you've seen yeah. all the hangover movies, he's the funny guy in the hangover, the one with the beard and the hangover. I mean, he's hilarious. He's in due date. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Due date. And he plays the guy that actually robbed it. And I mean, he'd done a fantastic job and it was, it was funny. So like that movie could have played off a couple of different ways. It could have went serious 
but they done it the comedy way and it was it was fantastic so there's definitely a a lot of different ways you can go with this for sure so i hope it gets picked up man i hope you get a i hope you get the book deal i hope they pick something up with a maybe a reality show and then you know a, a big screen premiere too and i'm uh, i should expect an invite for that too if that happens by the way oh absolutely but I, let me tell you from the heart um i've been a cr- criminal my whole life you know i've uh, since i was a kid this is all i know mm-hmm. you know but um when my girls came into my life that's the only thing that would have changed me take me out of where i'm at you know right. uh, you just don't one day say yeah i mean i know people love to hear it but it's bullshit when people say yeah i'm not that person anymore and they say it just to say it come on I'm telling you, that's not who I was. I'm, I'm that way now because of my girls. You know, I I can't imagine being one second away from them. But uh, it, it's not easy to change your whole life. This is not a overnight thing, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, are you on any types of social medias? I am on uh, Facebook. I'm Picasso Vega on Facebook. I'm also uh, Picasso Born in Brooklyn. That's our uh, main page for the movie. Okay. And also on um, YouTube, it's uh, Pic- the Picasso of Thieves. The, yeah, the Picasso of Thieves. And uh, on LinkedIn, too, Picasso Vega or Picasso Born in Brooklyn or the Picasso of Thieves. Anywhere you Google me, we're out there. We're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll put some of those direct links in the uh, show notes in the bottom of this episode on YouTube. Obviously, if anybody's listening on audio, if you want to track him down, you can go to the uh, search engines that he just mentioned and track him down there. Uh, man, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on the show and telling your story. It's a hell of a story. And my friend, we wish you nothing but the best going forward and much success. I want you to uh, look at the movie, watch it, and then tell me, uh, have me back on the show. You can tell me the truth, what you yes. feel. Yes, absolutely. Now, I definitely. I value it. the truth. Yeah. If you still think it sucks, I want you to tell me it sucks. <laughs> well, I can tell you if it's anything related to Scarface, like you've mentioned, then I'm probably going to be a fan, but I will hold off until I see it and I will have you back on and I'll give you my honest opinion for sure. 100%. I appreciate it, brother. You have no idea how much I appreciate being on your show. Well, thank, thank you. you. It was a pleasure having you. I'm, I'm glad you were able to, to stop by ladies and gentlemen. I am Hollywood Wade. That was the Picasso of Thieves. And unfortunately, we are out of time. So tune in next week for an all-new episode of Crime and Entertainment. Picasso, we'll see you, my friend. Thanks, brother. Much love, bro. Peace.